Good morning, good evening, good night, good day, and welcome to MIT InnoTherm Colloquium number line. I'm Gang Chen, and uh, today we have a, a very exciting talk on hydrogen, and I just learned uh, from uh, Professor Ogazaki actually there are over 280,000 deployment in household of hydrogen system, uh, the fuel cell system in Japan. That's uh, really amazing. Uh, so uh, we have a very exciting panel um, consisting of uh, see, uh, Professor Rom Majunda and uh, uh, Professor uh, Takata. And uh, the moderator is no stranger. And uh, so let me just introduce Jung again, and uh, he will introduce the rest of the speaker and the panelist. And uh, June is currently uh, the department head at the uh, Mechanical Engineering Department at uh, the University of Tokyo. And he's also visiting researcher at the uh, Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence. And his research area in nanoscale heat transfer, interfacial dynamics, uh, thermoelectrics, materials informatics, multi-scale computing. And uh, I also had a great pleasure working with June before and with that, uh, let me uh, turn to Jung and uh, you can take it over here from here. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Guan. Let me share my screen. Okay, so um, my great pleasure to be back as a moderator in this colloquium. And uh, I would like to first of all thank the organizers at MIT, led by Professor Gan Chen. Uh, today, as Gan said, we have a very exciting topic on hydrogen energy. And the presenter today is Professor Ken Okazaki. Hold on. Professor Ken Okazaki. Uh, he's a currently uh, institute professor, Professor Emeritus uh, of uh, Institute of Innovation Research at Tokyo Institute of Technology. Uh, formerly, he has been the Dean of School of Engineering at uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology and pre President of Hydrogen Energy Systems Society of Japan and Heat Transfer Society of Japan. And he was also a Vice President of Japan Society of Mechanical Engineers and also official member of the Science Council of Japan at the Cabinet Office. His research areas uh, include hydrogen-based advanced energy systems and fuel cells, clean and high efficiency coal and biomass technologies, non-equilibrium plasma chemistry and applications. We also have a two great moderators today, oh sorry, a panelist today. The first panelist, and not to mention is Professor Arun Majumda. He's currently professor at Stanford University's, University in Mechanical Engineering, Material Science and Photon Science. He's also co-director of Stanford Precourt Institute of Energy. He was formerly a uh, founding director of RPE at US Department of Energy, acting under Secretary of Energy, US Department of Energy, Vice President of Energy at Google, professor at University of California, Berkeley, and he's been a member of these organizations. His research areas include electrochemical and thermochemical redox reactions, nanoscale trans heat transfer materials and devices, energy conversion, transport, and storage, biomolecular analysis, and nanoscale imaging and microscopy. The other panelist is Professor Yasuyuki Takata. He's currently a professor at Department of Mechanical Engineering, International Institute of Carbon Neutral Energy Research, Eisner, at Kyushu University. He's also vice president of Asian Union of Thermal Science and Engineering, he was formerly a president of Heat Transfer Society of Japan and also president of Japan Society of Thermal Physical Properties. He's been awarded, um, received many awards in the research areas of hydrogen thermal physical properties at high pressures, effective surface wettability on liquid vapor phase change, and heat transfer enhancement of boiling and uh, evaporation. Okay, before we move on to the presentation, I would like to remind you about the format of this colloquium. Uh, here's the agenda of today. 
Um, we'll ask Professor Okazaki to give about 40 minutes presentation. Yeah. And that will be followed up by a 30 minutes or so discussion before we wrap up. Uh, meanwhile, right after I finish talking, either during Professor Okazaki's talk or during the discussion, you're very welcome, or please do, ask questions. When you ask questions, please use the Q&A button in Zoom, and we will be pulling from that stream the questions. Questions are visible only to the panelists, not to the other attendees. Please also submit any suggestion you have for future topics and speakers. And note that uh, this colloquium is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube later. This might also include questions which we can get to today. And if you, when you ask questions, if you prefer your question to be anonymous, please state so in your question. Otherwise, we'll be calling your name. Okay. One more thing before moving on to the presentation. I would like to make an announcement for the next um, colloquium, next webinar, which is on 19th of August, the same Wednesday, same time. Uh, it will be about thermal management of electric vehicles, uh, new engineering challenges. Let me also um, mention, sorry, mention, I'm sorry, about the uh, future events. Uh, this is on um, September 2nd. The topic will be Earth's energy balance. Okay. So with that, I would like to introduce Professor Okazaki, or I would like to ask him to give a presentation. Uh, yeah. Let me Okazaki share. Sensei, yeah, yes. the screen's all yours, please. Hmm. Can you see that? Yes, we see the screen. Um, okay. But do you want to okay. do this? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for introducing me. Hello, everybody. My name is Ken Okazaki of Tokyo Institute of Technology. First of all, I'd like to say thanks to the organizers, especially Professor Gan Chen of MIT, uh, to give me this kind of opportunity. Basically, I like the fundamental researches, but today I'd like to talk about an overview of hydrogen uh, on the significant role of hydrogen toward SDGs, sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. The outline of my talk today is uh, why uh, can hydrogen uh, can hydrogen contribute to SDGs and uh, Japan's history of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies and basic hydrogen strategy and roadmap in Japan and various R&D activities for hydrogen energy and global, global scale uh, CO2-free hydrogen supply chain and world trends including Germany, EU, US and China. And finally, I'd like to mention about the fundamental researches related to heat and mass transfer coupled with electrochemistry and concluding remarks. As shown here, hydrogen is a secondary energy and can be produced from various different kinds of energy resources, uh, including uh, domestic fuel cells, overseas unused energy and renewable energies. Especially renewable energy uh, is the most important to produce hydrogen in the future. And hydrogen is transported to the demand side and uh, uh, to be used to realize the CO2-free industry and CO2-free mobilities. Uh, this slide shows the renewable energy, situation of renewable energy in Japan. At present, 
the percentage of renewable energy is only 12% in Japan, but we have to increase the, this percentage to 22 to 24% by 2030, including solar power, wind power, biomass, and geothermal. Especially in Japan, the solar power, PV, will be, play a very important role. Here we discuss why hydrogen now, uh, because of clean energy, flexible energy carrier, and long experience in hydrogen development in Japan. But when we discuss about the, the energy security and global environment, yes, Uh, global environment, uh, hydrogen should have a large, massive contribution. Uh, and uh, another important uh, importance of hydrogen is that hydrogen can be, can enhance to introduce more and more renewable energies. Mm, because uh, renewable energy, especially the natural energy, has a la very large many fluctuations from seconds, minutes, hours to seasons. So for the load leveling uh, for that, the hydrogen will play a very important role. Now another one is the large electricity production above demand. In this case, the hydrogen can, hydrogen can store uh, much uh, amount of uh, uh, energy for long term. Battery may have a small, um, battery may have a same role, but energy storage capacity uh, and the duration time are much smaller than hydrogen as shown in the next slide. Uh, as shown here, hydrogen has a very large capacity uh, corresponding to one gigawatt and uh, can store energy for long time uh, corresponding to this uh, minute, hour, day, week, and even seasons. So hydrogen will play a very important role when we introduce more and more renewable, en renewable fluctuating renewable energies. Here, I uh, mentioned about Japan's history uh, of R&D, R&D in the hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. Uh, we have more than 30 years experience for hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. Uh, 2000, 2009, we introduced the household fuel cell, PFC, and 2011, we introduced household fuel cell, SOFC. And uh, 2013, we introduced uh, the uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen refueling stations and dissemination, dissemination of hydrogen stations. And as you know well, the actual commercialized fuel cell vehicles sales started. 2014. And now the global global hydrogen sub, hydrogen supply chain and hydrogen power generation are now going on into including various demonstrations as explained later. As for the strategy, as for the national strategies. Uh, basic hydrogen strategy uh, was established uh, about two and a half years ago, December uh, 2017, uh, declared by Prime Minister. And uh, among them, hydrogen cost is the most important. Uh, the target is shown here, $3 per kilogram. Uh, kilogram hydrogen by 2030 to two dollars by uh, two dollars per kilogram hydrogen by 2050. 
And to realize that, the large-scale hydrogen supply chains and massive usage of hydrogen in mobility, power generation, and industry are general. Uh, uh, and the key technologies to be developed are shown here. In the production, the electrolyzer system is quite important. And transportation, uh, for the transportation, uh, which kind of energy carrier should be used. And the utilization part, our demand side, fuel cell for mobility and power generation, and hydrogen fired power generation will be quite important in the future. This is the scenario for basic hydrogen strategy. Uh, as for the hydrogen volume, uh, uh, this is a present picture, and the, this is a, the, the, the target by 2030. The hydro, as for the hydrogen volume, uh, the target in 2030 is about uh, the 300,000 tons per year, and the cost should be $3 uh, per kilogram hydrogen. And the power generation cost, it should be the 17 Japanese yen per kilowatt hour, which corresponds to the 15 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, for the mobility, hydrogen stations, uh, 900 should be introduced, and eight uh, FCV, fuel cell vehicles, should be introduced, uh, 800 thousand fuel cell vehicles should be introduced. And uh, utilization of fuel cells in the, for the household, the, in a, um, private houses, uh, should be 5 million units by 2030. So we are now going on uh, to realize such kind of target. By the way, what is the uh, definition of hydrogen society. I myself uh, this, uh, uh, said th th about three or four years ago uh, as uh, such like this. A society where hydrogen used as a secondary, uh, secondary energy accounts for over 20% of all energy consumption, including the uh, industrial applications and hydrogen quantitatively and sufficiently contributes to energy security and uh, carbon neutral society. Uh, th these are the two major issues to real realize such as hydrogen society. One is the domestic expansion of demand, including fuel cell vehicles, residential fuel cell cogeneration units, and hydrogen electrical, electrical power generations. And to, uh, for that uh, demand, uh, we have to realize the supply chain for a large amount of hydrogen. One is CO2-free hydrogen derived from domestic uh, renewable energies uh, through P2G. And also CO2-free hydrogen from unused energy from overseas. Uh, so, increase of demand and supply, both are quite important. This kind of 20%, this value uh, is, uh, was supported by the Hydrogen Council uh, next year, next year of my uh, proposal. Maybe all of you know uh, well, but here I'll show briefly uh, about the principle of fuel cell, uh, like this. This is a membrane, and this is a fuel cell, and this is a MEA, me membrane electrode assembly, and uh, fuel cell stack. More than 300 fuel cell. Uh, 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 MEA 
uh, gathered in the one stack, more than one, uh, three, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, th more than 300 cells uh, will be packed in the fuel cell stack and installed in the car. Uh, this is a high pressure hydrogen tank. Uh, pressure is 70 megapascal, corresponding to 700 atmospheric pressure. Such kind of high pressure hydrogen tank is just below your rear seat. <laughs> Many people may be interested in the comparison between uh, battery EV and FC EV, uh, in between hybrid EV and plug-in hybrid EV here. FC EV, fuel cell vehicle, has an advantage, especially for large vehicles, including buses and trucks, uh, considering cruising distance and uh, charging time. For the fuel cell vehicle, Hydrogen refueling time is only three minutes. Uh, much, la much longer time should be necessary uh, for the charging of battery EV. Uh, this slide shows the status and target of fuel cell vehicles in Japan. I already explained the target uh, of introducing fuel cell vehicle is 800,000. Uh, by 2030. And uh, by 2020, we try to introduce 40,000 first vehicles, but actually, can you guess? Actually, 10,000 first vehicles. Uh, that's the, behind the, our target. And first buses are also uh, introduced into public services. Another important uh, system to use hydrogen is the stationary fuel cell system, stationary fuel cell uh, cogeneration systems. Uh, city gas is uh, reformed to form hydrogen and uh, CO2, and hydrogen is used to form electricity and heat or hot water. Uh, through the fuel cell systems and supplied to the houses. Now the, we uh, have uh, 280,000 units are already introduced into the private houses, including my house. I introduced this kind of system in my house uh, about seven, more than seven years ago. Uh, this is the ongoing project. As for the mobility, I explained already, but as for the hydrogen power generation, the hydrogen cogeneration demonstration project was uh, the uh, demonstration has been successfully done two years ago in Kobe area uh, using hydrogen gas turbine uh, system of 1.7 megawatt. Uh, this is, uh, of course, a cogeneration system, and electricity is supplied, and heat is also supplied to surrounding hospitals, athletic gyms, and others. The other big project is to develop the large-scale hydrogen combustion gas turbine. Uh, this is an example to develop the um, burner system. Uh, as you know, Japan has uh, almost no energy resources, uh, so to supply a large amount of hydrogen, we in Japan are developing global scale hydrogen supply chains. Two are almost come to the demonstration stage. One is the, uh, using the uh, associated gas uh, reform to form hydrogen to make MCH, uh, methyl 
cyclohexane and transport it to Japan. And the other one big project is the using the lignite of Victorian state of Australia uh, to make hydrogen and liquefied and then liquefied and then transported to Japan by the liquid hydrogen tanker. Uh, I'd like to explain a little more uh, ongoing project. This is the Brunei uh, project I explained. This is the Japan Australian project, uh, pilot project. Brown coal is gasified to form hydrogen and CO2. CO2 is transferred to the uh, CCS process. CCS means uh, carbon capture and storage under the ground, under the ground. So CCS process. And the liquefied hydrogen is transported to Japan by hydrogen tanker to the demand side. Okay. So in this case, we can realize no CO2 emissions, even though we use the coal. Another uh, one big project, a domestic project in Japan is the Fukushima Renew Renewable Hydrogen Project uh, using the PV, uh, photovoltaic power generation to form the uh, hydrogen and uh, uh, electricity is used to make hydrogen through electrolyzer. And hydrogen is planned to transport it to the Tokyo area to be used uh, or the Tokyo Olympic Games, but uh, it is uh, postponed or canceled now. Uh, next slide shows a diagram of this kind of systems. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, the pilot scale, the liquid hydrogen tanker, the, uh, like this. The, and the commercialized, the commercialized scale is shown here uh, by 2030. But this kind of shape is not a dream. Actually, we realize the, this kind of liquid hydrogen tanker and the world first liquefied hydrogen carrier, so-called Suiso, Suiso means hydrogen, Suiso Frontier. Uh, launching ceremony was actually held in December last year, only half year ago. So uh, as shown here, we have come to this kind of actual stage. At the present, hydrogen uh, still play an only small part in the energy sectors. Uh, to expand hydrogen utilization, various factors as shown here are necessary, such as large scale hydrogen supply from abroad and large scale utilization of hydrogen in various industrial sectors, including electrical power generation, oil complex, industrial applications, city utility, and transportation, hydrogen station, co-generation, and zero emission buildings. For that, these kind of challenges are definitely necessary, including big investment, especially big investment, and cost down of hydrogen price, uh, definitely necessary. Uh, to accelerate to accelerate such kind of imp, uh, imp, to Im, uh, accelerate the implementation, this kind of this kind of trinity among policymaker, industry, and the financial sectors uh, uh, necessary. Uh, in the, you know Aichi Prefecture. Uh, is actually promoting this kind of initiative uh, by a collaboration of Aichi Prefecture and uh, the energy companies as shown like this. Uh, this is the uh, Aichi Low Carbon 
hydrogen supply chain uh, 2030 vision uh, uh, by the collaboration uh, among IT prefecture, energy companies, and also big Toyota. Headquarters of Toyota is in the IT prefecture. And the first stage, uh, this is uh, the, the target is uh, the expand uh, renewable energy based low carbon hydrogen supply chain using the existing infrastructures uh, like this. So it's so first stage, we already rea realized sustainable devel development of low, ca low carbon hydrogen supply chains and using the biogas uh, bio and transport it to the usual existing uh, city gas pipelines to the Toyota for factories and uh, used to supply hydrogen to the forklifts. And second stage, low carbon uh, power, low carbon power, transport, heat, heating, and industrial processes in every field like this. And finally, the elimination of reliance on fossil fuels through greater distribution of hydrogen over wide areas like this. We are now on this uh, stage. And I am also chair of this uh, project. As for the uh, national hydrogen strategies, uh, this is an example of the Germany, uh, national project, national hydrogen strategy in Germany. Uh, they are, of course, uh, also con uh, considering the combination of uh, large introduction of renewable energy and green hydrogen. So, surprising is the budget size. Uh, budget size is 9 billion euro for hydrogen, corresponding to 10 billion US dollars or 1 trillion Japanese yen. Uh, which is correspond to which correspond to the seven percent of total budget of uh, economical recovery after COVID-19. And hydrogen production uh, to by electrolyzers, uh, the five gigawatt by 2030 and ten gigawatt uh, by 2040, like this. As for the United States, uh, the famous national project, so-called hydrogen at scale energy system, uh, operated by the uh, DOE. Uh, Arun was uh, one of the panelists, uh, was the number two or number three of DOE before. Uh, the important thing is uh, matching among energy sectors, electrical grid, and hydrogen generation, storage, distribution, and utilization, including industrial applications. The concept is almost similar uh, uh, like others. As for the, uh, about China, uh, this is also surprising. Uh, the, this slide, was given to me by the uh, leader uh, in hydrogen in China, Professor Mao in Xinhua Tashi, Xinhua University. The total budget uh, for two years, 2017 to 2018, uh, uh, the 230 billion yuan correspond to 30 billion US dollars and 3.5 trillion Japanese yen. 3.5 Cho N. Uh, so not only in Japan, as shown here, uh, not only in Japan, but also Germany, United States, China started to realize the hydrogen society. Finally, I like to sh mention about the fundamental researches related to heat and mass transfer, including the fuel cell, 
and electrolyzer. I don't have enough time to explain the details. Fuel cell and electrolyzer. And hydrogen oxygen combustion and turbine system. And distribution, distributed cooperative energy system. And hydrogen carrier and supply systems. Uh, including the physical properties of liquid hydrogen, including the ortho para uh, transitions. The yes will mention about this later, I think. And many others, uh, including fundamental physics, chemistry, thermodynamics, uh, very important uh, research subject uh, still uh, play a very important role to realize the hydrogen society. Uh, some example uh, we did in Tokyo Tech uh, shown here. This slide shows the Tokyo Tech interdisciplinary research project on PEFC polymer electrolyte fuel cell with higher energy efficiency and durability in collaboration with mechanical engineering uh, electrochemistry, catalytic chemistry, and polymer science like this. So we did this kind of collaboration among various diff different uh, professors, uh, among professors of different research field, uh, different background. This is also one example I myself did many, many years ago. Uh, I use the molecular dynamics to calculate the proton transport in the membrane. And also I uh, use, uh, I did the first principle analysis uh, for the uh, surface catalytic reactions for polymer electrolyte fuel cells like this. Uh, now the, uh, this is the old one, but I, my background, background is mechanical engineering, but we sub, uh, submitted this kind of result to the Journal of Electrochemical Society like this. But uh, this is old one, and now much higher uh, stage of research are now going on by many researchers, including the mechanical, uh, thermal, thermal a mechanical engineering field of summer engineering field. Like this. Another topic is like, like this. Another example is a new cycle of hydrogen and pure oxygen combustion gas turbine. Combustion product is only steam. And then the simple hybrid system of, of Brayton cycle and ranking, ranking cycle could be possible uh, like this. Uh, uh, it, uh, as shown in this uh, temperature entropy diagram. Uh, as shown here, uh, a very, very high efficiency could be realized in principle. But uh, we need many uh, fundamental research is to realize that. So we are now starting this project supported by NEDO. Finally, I'll say about the concluding remarks. Hydrogen has a high possibility to realize energy security and zero CO2 emissions. Uh, the energy and the environmental sectors of SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And Japan has 30 years history of de developing hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. And the basic hydrogen strategy and roadmap has been established. R&D of hydrogen technologies are remarkable in Japan and fuel cell vehicles and the stationary uh, fuel cell cogeneration systems have been already commercialized. Demonstration of hydrogen gas turbine system for power generation and cogeneration are going on to realize a real hydrogen society, including, including the industry. And various challenging projects are now going on using CO2-free hydrogen from renewable energies. We still have many, many fundamental scientific research subjects 
related to heat and mass transfer with electrochemistry. That's all my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ken Okazaki. That was a really great talk. Um, so now we want to move on to the discussion, but before doing so, I would like to do, uh, suggest to do a poll. Actually, I was supposed to do it before Ken's talk, um, which I forgot to do. So I'm going to do yeah, it now. That's right? okay. <laughs> Sorry about yeah. that. So um, here is the poll. Okay, so do you see this? I guess everybody sees it, or maybe not. Let me, I guess, do you see it? Yeah, okay, people started voting, so I think you see it. So at present, hydrogen plays only a small role in the energy sector. What is the most important factor for a wide use of hydrogen energy? So there was, there was actually a question related to this poll. So I think this poll is quite yeah, timely. Yes, yes. Okay, so we reached already half, 50%, 50% of the people already answered. Seventy percent. Let's give it thirty more seconds, or maybe fifteen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to end the poll here and show you the result. Okay, so here is the result. Um, 34% of the people voted for hydrogen cost. And then the next one is technology innovation. It follows yeah. national strategy, investment, and public outreach. Okay. Which, uh, should we do the other poll also now? Uh, There's a second poll. Yes, but, but I'd like to mention something about oh, please this. Do, please do, please okay. do. Great. Yeah, yeah. I, I talked to uh, every, every point. Uh, in my talk, so but uh, the uh, result is very correct. Hydrogen cost is the key uh, to realize the hydrogen society, and to reduce the cost, uh, innovative technologies are definitely necessary. So I agree this result. John, please uh, yes uh, do the next poll. Sure. Okay, so um, I'm going to do the next poll. Um, all right, how do I do the next one? No, hold, hold on. Let me hey, do this, this is again. the first one. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, here. I'm sorry. Okay. So this is the second poll. What is the most, what is most important when we discuss the difference different roles between battery-driven electric vehicle and fuel cell-driven electric vehicle. I think a lot of people are also interested in this question. So please start voting that we, so that we know what you're thinking now before the discussion, so that the, the panelists can elaborate on this during the discussion. Okay, so we have already reached 71%, 71%. We can close it almost. Okay, so people are still voting. All right, okay, let's stop it here. And let me share the result. Cost and lifetime, 37%. And 34%, uh, very similar. Charging time and refueling time. Okay. And then others are answering size and cruising distance. Yeah, yeah. All right, maybe we can go around the, uh, Ken, maybe you can start making comments on this. Yeah, the, the, but uh, those items uh, depend on the, the different standpoint. Uh, the, both fuel vehicles and battery uh, vehicles, uh, both are very expensive now, okay? 
but uh, I think the charging time and the refueling time, uh, hydrogen refueling time, so much different. Three minutes and uh, uh, thirty. Uh, three minutes and 30, 30 minutes and a very uh, large difference. So uh, this uh, result, uh, I almost agree. But uh, <laughs> how do you think, Jun? <laughs> or we can ask the panelists, Arun, do you have any comments on these? Oh, you're muted. I think you're muted. Good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. Um, first of all, I, it's great to be on a panel with uh, my old friends, uh, Ken Okazaki and Yasu Takata. Um, we have been friends for many, many years now. <laughs> um, so, uh, and also congratulations to MIT for launching this and continuing with this. Um, it's a great forum to kind of um, uh, discuss details of issues that we all care about. Um, the issue about uh, the battery versus um, hydrogen fuel cell for transportation. Uh, there are multiple ways to dissect this. Um, I can tell you about the US side, um, the long haul trucking, which requires the trucks to be on the road as much as possible. <clears throat> and for fast refueling, there is um, significant interest in hydrogen but hydrogen will have to compete with battery uh, long haul trucking as well. The uh, gravimetric energy density of hydrogen is, is very high. And so if you're looking about loads and uh, carrying capacity of trucking, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And these are centralized facilities for refueling. And that makes a lot of sense. At least in the United States for uh, light duty vehicles, the battery electric vehicles, um, the infrastructure for distributing electricity already existed. If the electricity distribution infrastructure did not exist before, I think battery electric vehicles would have had a really difficult time. But that already has been around for the last hundred years. And so refueling is, and you're not, you don't need fast refueling of battery, uh, you know, too often. And so you can, you know, stay at home and get it, um, get it charged overnight. And most of the charging that we are going to see, and if you talk to the folks in Tesla, for example, they'll say most of the charging is level two charging, which is roughly about 10 kilowatts or so. And that's mm -hmm. adequate for most of the charging for light duty vehicles. So I think in, in the light duty area, the battery electric vehicle is going to play a very dominant role in the United States. So I think you see the different parts of the transportation sector adopting different technologies for given a the economics and the just the logistics of things so i think that that would be that's where we see things going in the us thank you yes yeah, do you have a yeah so yeah i'm i i'm, I'm a little bit surprised with you know two you know uh, quick <coughs> polls about the, the same answers, you know, the majority is uh, many people are thinking cost. Okay. But, uh, regarding the charging time and the refueling time, so Ken mentioned that uh, uh, currently the, you know, fuel cell vehicle needs only three minutes to refill the uh, hydrogen. <clears throat> but the former time, so the hydrogen uh, tank pressure was <clears throat> 35 megapascal. At that time, the cruise range was uh, not so <clears throat> long compared with a gasoline car, you know. Then, so uh, tank pressure increased up to 70 megapascal. Now, maybe 80 megapascal or something like that. So then, <clears throat> that when we refill the hydrogen into the high pressure tank, so adiabatic compression occurs and increase the temperature. Therefore, the, I, currently the maximum <clears throat> limit temperature is 85 degrees Celsius. Therefore, so before refilling the hydrogen, so we have to cool down the hydrogen in advance down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Okay. 
that's <clears throat> that's why the hydrogen diffusion station becomes very com complicated and uh, it's not it's easy to reduce the cost. <laughs> that is my <laughs> observation about it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, June, can yes, I say please something? Yes, please go on. Of course, okay. of course. Uh, the, we were just the, uh, discussing about the uh, mobility, the hydrogen utilization uh, for mobility. But uh, as I said in my talk, the hydrogen is more important in the industry to realize a CO2-free society. Okay. Uh, only the mobilities, uh, share only 10 or 15 percent of total energy consumption. Others, most of uh, energy consumption is uh, done in industry. So large-scale power generation using hydrogen, large-scale uh, some kind of uh, power generation uh, of the uh, fuel, using fuel cell and the larger one using the hydrogen turbine, even the hydrogen boiler uh, can reduce the CO2 emissions. Okay, so large scale hydrogen consumption system is, will be more important when we realize a CO2 free society using hydrogen. Uh, I'd like to ask some opinion about that, Arun. Yeah, I mean, look, today there's a global production of about 70 million tons of hydrogen globally per year. Mm. Almost, um, uh, there's a large fraction of that it goes into ammonia production, which goes into fertilizers. We eat our food based on hydrogen production, right? So, I mean, that's a, that's a big chunk, about 25, 30% of hydrogen consumption. The other large fraction is, is refineries, petrochemical refineries. So Ken is exactly right that most of the hydrogen used today is industrial, uh, little for transportation, frankly, and um, I think in the future, uh, that 70 million tons of hydrogen per year, we hope it gets to about a billion tons per year because we need that hydrogen for decarbonizing the very difficult sectors to decarbonize, which is industrial heat um, and, and steel production, concrete production. We need a fuel to be able to do that because we cannot do everything with cheap electricity. So I think that's where the hydrogen, the big use of the hydrogen is going to be. And that's why we need a, you know, I think someone asked about the cost of hydrogen production and that cost for carbon free hydrogen has to come down by a factor of two or three to compete with the carbon based hydrogen production that has CO2 emissions. And so there's a lot of research that is needed for both the cost reduction and sort of mobility of hydrogen as well, moving hydrogen from one place to the other. And we can get into that discussion later on. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so that you mentioned, there were actually quite a few questions about transport. Not, I don't, I don't mean vehicle, but the transport of hydrogen. And uh, so for example, Japan has few primary energy sources. So hydrogen, which is a secondary energy source should also be imported from overseas as shown in the presentation. But isn't it difficult to import hydrogen because of its low volumetric density? There's also a question about LCA. What is LCA of um, uh, liquefying lignites in Australia and bringing it to Japan? Or there's also questions asking, isn't it better to, uh, if using brown coal, isn't it better to import brown coal instead of the, uh, instead of the gasification inside Japan? So um, we can take a, a question at a time. So, but I think in general, the question is, how do you bring um, hydrogen to Japan and what is the cost and the LCA of it? Yes, yes. Uh, the, in the early stage of this, uh, this project, uh, the KHI, Kawasaki Heavy Industry, uh, <laughs> they uh, calculated, estimated the CIF cost at the port. CIF cost uh, to be about 30 yen per uh, normal cubic meters, uh, correspond to about three dollars per uh, kilogram hydrogen. Okay, so even if we include the extra energy, extra cost uh, for the liquefier 
and the gas fire, uh, we can realize the cost to be about three dollars per kilogram in the future. Not now. This year is just starting the demonstration project. It was actually so, a question. Um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. LCA, LCA analysis has been done many by many people. Okay. Do you, other panelists have comment on this? Uh, <clears throat> I have a comment on the you know the if we import the uh, hydrogen in a liquid uh, <coughs> basis, so yeah, I think the liquefaction cost is uh, quite expensive. Like uh, I think uh, by left calculation, the minimum work for liquefaction will be that almost a ten percent of the uh, HHV high higher heating value. Or more. <laughs> or more. Yeah, I mean that I say I, I, I mentioned about the theoretical work. Therefore, okay. the actual work is I think uh, two or three times more, at least. Then, so the important thing is to how to recover the cold energy is one issue when we import, especially in Japan. Japan must import in the form of uh, liquid hydrogen, maybe. So, yeah, uh, the so-called low temperature exergy, okay, mm -hmm. exergy, uh, yeah. how to use the low temperature exergy mm -hmm. uh, in Japan side is quite important. Uh, first, we try to use the low temperature exergy uh, to make the pure hydrogen for the hydrogen uh, oxygen, ah, sorry, uh, to make the uh, pure oxygen to separate mm -hmm. oxygen from the atmosphere uh, to realize uh, hydrogen and pure oxygen gas turbine system. But uh, uh, through the actual precise consideration, calculation, it's impossible. So, but uh, low temperature uh, exergy can uh, enhance the turbine, efficient, turbine efficiency mm -hmm. by the, how to say, Interme intermediate cooling system in the gas turbine. Okay. For you, that purpose, mean, uh, so, uh, you can uh, take it. After, you know, co com intercooler of the intercooler. Intercool oh, yes, it's intercooler. Uh, for that purpose, low temperature uh, uh, energy or exergy can be uh, effectively used to increase the uh, overall efficiency. Okay. But really? still, we are uh, discussing about that. Yeah, for some thoughts on uh, hydrogen um, infrastructure and hydrogen, moving hydrogen. The way I look at it is uh, there are two sites. One is on land and the other is over, sea, over oceans. On land, and, you know, we all talk about moving hydrogen, but the biggest challenge uh, and I'll only give the U.S. perspective, the biggest challenge is to build the infrastructure or pipelines to move hydrogen. This is not just a technical issue. There mm -hmm. are hydrogen embrittlement issues that we need to address, but it's just the issue of logistics, of permitting, of NIMBY, all kinds of uh, challenges. So on land, the best way to move hydrogen is to move electrons and figure out how to produce cheap hydrogen by water splitting with the electrolyzers that Ken talked about. And the cost of the capex of the electrolyzers has to come down by a factor of two to three to make that hydrogen you know, cheap oh, yeah. enough, yeah. carbon-free yeah. hydrogen cheap enough. The other way to move hydrogen with existing infrastructure is methane, it's natural gas pipelines, and then use methane to produce the hydrogen because the great way to move hydrogen is by CH4. And so there is steam methane reforming and, and there's, uh, which is existing then if you do the carbon capture of steam methane reforming, you know, the cost is gonna be about $1.50 to $2 a kilogram, somewhere there. And that's, and that's the competition for any other ways to produce hydrogen. So that's the existing technology. And now there's research going on, research going in my lab on methane pyrolysis. So if you can produce hydrogen and produce solid carbon 
that's much, much easier to handle than CO2. And maybe if you can make carbon fibers, you could use it for other applications. And there's a, in a sort of tool reven, a, a two revenue approaches. The question really comes up, what about moving hydrogen across oceans? Today's infrastructure, I mean, there's a cost associated with hydrogen that Ken and, uh, talked about, but the infrastructure to move large amounts of hydrogen today exists in LNG, okay? And once you move LNG, you can then reform it to produce hydrogen in your local entity and then distribute it. And I think that in terms of just infrastructure cost and the time that LNG infrastructure already exists and much easier to move that, move it that way. Not to say that we should not be building liquid hydrogen ships, but that will be complementary and has to compete with existing LNG infrastructure to move large amounts of fuel. Hmm. But yeah. the, temper the temperature level is uh, so much different. Uh, liquid, hi liquid hydrogen, the temperature is to minus 253 uh, degree, 100 degree lower than the liquid uh, natural gas. Yeah. <laughs> so technology is somewhat different, including the insulating, heat insulating process also. So, so but it's much easier. It's much easier to move LNG than to move liquid hydrogen. <laughs> oh, why, why? <laughs> <laughs> because the, the technology already exists. The people, it's already going on right now. Uh, LNG yeah. is being moved from different parts of the world. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, right. So anyway, uh, Arun said many things, uh, yeah. very important things. But uh, uh, to distribute hydrogen on land, the, we have no pipelines in Japan, but the US, you have uh, many pipelines, natural gas pipelines. So uh, add the hydrogen into the natural gas pipelines is one possibility. Another one is the combined the hydrogen, CO2-free hydrogen and uh, um, CO2 to form the methane. And then use the existing infrastructure of gas pipelines but the what is uh, what i am interested inter, interested in most interested in is the direct conversion from methane to solid carbon and hydrogen as you said i mean you said about that that's right that's right so I mean, that is, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's been around to make carbon black for a long time. Yeah. There's, a, hey. there's a company called Monolith out here that is making, doing methane pyrolysis. No, not, not only carbon black, but other, uh, some sophisticated structure could be also possible. Right, exactly. The, yeah. So that's, and in fact, right now we have an arpa -E project to, yeah. to take methane and produce hydrogen and carbon nanotubes at scale. Yeah. And, this kind and of subject could, I like. <laughs> right. Because then you, know. you could, you know, the United States doesn't produce enough carbon fibers. In fact, most yeah, of the yeah, carbon yeah. fibers we import from Japan. And mm -hmm. so if we can build using our own natural gas, mm -hmm. uh, produce hydrogen, carbon-free hydrogen and make carbon fibers, mm -hmm. that has implications in the auto industry and many other industries. Yeah. I think that's very um, sort of, great discussion for young people who are listening to this webinar. I think they are looking for sort of technical challenges that they could contribute to this scene. I think that, that was really great. And also yeah, fundamental. Yeah, so do, actually. Fundamental, yeah. yes, fundamental science. I'm sure a lot of people are interested in the fundamental science, chemistry and so on. Let me just switch gear a little bit. I think uh, we also have a, some questions, getting some questions about the safety issues of hydrogen technology. Uh, for example, uh, Luke Richard Higgins, what are the safety requirements concerns associated with hydrogen vehicle? Are there currently classifications for testing this uh, certification of these vehicles? And there's an anonymous, qu question for, anonymous question asking questions related to storage safety for large scale hydrogen, how to endure the safety of vehicle, airplane, loaded with flammable uh, hydrogen gas, which could also make hydrogen vehicle airplane costier to engineer and slower to win public acceptance. So uh, maybe uh, either Yasu or Ken, maybe you can start. Oh, regarding uh, 
safety 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 mm-hmm. i i think it's safety if we do not have any accident <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before we discuss about that we mm. have to know the difference between explosion and burning right burning yeah Burning velocity. Burning velocity is very small, less than mm-hmm. one meter per second. And explosion is, uh, they has a very high speed, higher than the uh, sound speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we solve this kind of problem, theoretically, mm-hmm. we can have two eigenvalues. One mm-hmm. eigen, eigenvalue corresponds to the uh, normal uh, propagating uh, frame less than one meter per second. The other solution, the other uh, eigenvalue correspond to the, uh, the detonation, detonation, mm-hmm. explosion, uh, which has the uh, higher, the uh, velocity higher than the uh, sound speed. So we, so many public people misunderstand the, the, the difference between explosion and frame propagation okay mm-hmm. so burning and explosion a different phenomena su- based on the very fundamental sun point okay and yeah, then yeah. We, uh, as can can then we mention, discuss. Hmm? Yeah, as can okay. mention you know the sound speed speed of sound of hydrogen is very fast i think four times higher than methane yeah uh, but, therefore if there is a crack so leak rate is very fast mm-hmm. and the inside temperature decreases okay. you know rapidly more rapidly than you know uh, natural gas even mm-hmm. if, uh, if we have a same pressure initial pressure in the tank yeah. so if uh, therefore the, for safety I, I i i don't have any you know uh, how do you say uh, I, i'm okay with hydrogen but <laughs> Many people don't, don't like, okay? Oh, because it, Ken mentioned, you know, we, we, when we are, are getting the hydrogen vehicle, we are sitting on the high pressure tank. Not no, so but uh, the Toyota, uh, mm-hmm. before Toyota introduced the fuel cell vehicle into market, of course, they did the test and test and test uh, for safety. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Toyota people said that even if the big collision collide with other vehicles, uh, when the car itself is uh, uh, totally destroyed, but hydrogen tank remains as it was. Oh. They said. <laughs> they did the test and test and test to keep the safety, of course. Can I just add just one more comment? I completely agree with what Ken and Yasu said. Anything, any energy stored has safety issue. Okay, anything stored. Yeah. You take a lithium yeah, ion yeah. battery, yeah, yeah, in yeah. fact, the oxidizer oh, yeah, is yeah. already yeah. there. I, of course, I agree. In. A, yes. and, and so I, I think one has to look at it comprehensively as to, in a lithium ion battery, you don't even need outside air. The, the yeah. fuel and everything, you have a short circuit, exactly. lithium and battery, you're going to catch fire. Yeah. So, but that, you know, this technology that has been developed to keep it safe. And, and yes, there are a few accidents here and there, but there's a huge amount of attention spent mm-hmm. for, uh, for safety. The same thing in fuel tanks and gasoline fuel tanks. I mean, re- recall in the 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. the gasoline tanks were blowing up in some of the cars. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, people have spent time to make them safe. So I think safety is is a technical issue, number one, yeah. but it's also yeah. a societal acceptance issue that yeah, it yeah. is going to be safe. Right? Yeah. Great, great discussion. So we're also getting, I think some of that was mentioned already during the discussion, but we're getting a lot of questions about the hydrogen pul- uh, propulsion, direct propulsion, I think, using hydrogen. Uh, Peter Godard, God, Godard, why fuel cells have not just run eight, H2 into existing internal combustion based engines and generators. Can we instead uh, convert internal combustion energy vehicles to run on H2 and convert Honda diesel generators to run on H2, for example, and so on? 
Um, yes. So, could do anybody, any of you comment on this uh, using hydrogen for propulsion? Propulsion mm. uh, for airplane? Um, vehicle. Vehicle. Or e even, yeah, internal combustion engine, for example, vehicles. Mm -hmm. Or I guess airplane can be one of the examples. Too. Mm. I think the combustion, the, the combustion is different. Premixed, mm. you know, hydrogen combustion is, um, is different from premixed, um, you know, methane or other natural gas combustion. So the flame, mm. as, as Ken was pointing out, the flame speeds are different. So the burner design has to be different. And so it's not that it cannot be done, but, um, you know, we, we need to adapt to, to, the, uh, to the fact that uh, it's a different fuel and the reactions and the reaction kinetics are different. And as a result, the system has to be modified. Mm -hmm. Well, more than 20 years ago, uh, 1990s, the BMW, BMW actually developed the hydrogen combustion, internal combustion engine, uh, and successfully ran in the Munich city. I drove by also in Munich, okay. Uh, but uh, mm, the hydrogen consumption is not so large. So liquid hydrogen, if we keep the liquid hydrogen for a long time, the liquid hydrogen will boil off. Okay. So at this stage, uh, the uh, liquid hydrogen, uh, uh, hydrogen internal combustion engine using liquid hydrogen by BM uh, disappeared now. But uh, uh, BMW has very deep and high level experiences about that. Yeah, so do you have any comments on this? Yeah, uh, I have a question to uh, Ken about the you know, efficiency uh, of the internal combustion engine, uh, hydrogen car and also the uh, fuel cell vehicle. If we you compare the efficiency, wh which is advantage? Maybe fuel cell vehicle, right? Of course, fuel cell vehicle has mm -hmm. a higher higher efficiency. Higher efficiency. Uh, yeah, much higher efficiency, I think. Yeah. How many? Maybe forty percent. Uh, oh yeah. The internal combustion engine has uh, used to be used to used to be having uh, efficiency of about fourteen percent. Fourteen, fourteen percent. But it used to be okay. To now be. Uh, the high efficiency vehicles coming out, so the internal combustion engine uh, efficiency is coming up very rapidly, nearly more than 40% now. So difference uh, is becoming very smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. oh, it's so, complete. Yeah. Still, uh, fuel cell vehicle has a high, higher efficiency, but the difference uh, be is becoming smaller and smaller. Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, uh, uh, just a question for Ken. The octane yeah. number of hydrogen is more than 130 right, it's like 135, 140 or so, which means even with spark ignition engines, um, you can go up to higher compression ratio without knocking. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, you should be able to get pretty high efficiency uh, with yes. higher compression ratio. Mm -hmm. Even with spark ignition, you don't need compression ignition. Yeah, so uh, to increase the, uh, to, to realize the higher efficiency for internal combustion engine, uh, hydrogen internal combustion engine is very active. I have no experience on that, but uh, competing fuel cell, high efficiency, uh, yeah. engine, high efficiency, and competing. Okay. And in the future, both should be important. Arun, agree? Yeah, I think the, the benefit of having the engine is that the capex is much lower. And so <laughs> yeah. if, the if the efficiency becomes competitive, the operating cost is for the same amount of power and energy is roughly then becomes the same. So the 
capex will determine. And so the capital cost of the engine is much lower. Now, having said that, there are hydrogen embrittlement issues that we should not forget. And we still don't understand fully what is hydrogen embrittlement, how it works. So there are these other issues that, and, and someone said about 20% in introducing hydrogen in natural gas pipelines. It is true, you could do that. Hmm. We still don't completely understand what the impact of that is going to be on the lifetimes of the pipeline. And oh. because we don't completely understand hydrogen embrittlement. And so mm -hmm. this is scientific issues that are still yes. wide open for our students and postdocs to look at. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that's a very great comment. And I think yeah, it's very yeah, encouraging. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, we're getting, I, I'm very happy to see that people, a lot of people are positively impressed by the, um, the spread of household uh, in a farm. But at the same time, people are asking, what is the dollar per kilowatt or dollar per watt yeah. for the household generator or the co-generator? And I think we had this discussion with Gan before the session, and uh, <laughs> you, did, you, you didn't really know the numbers. I just want to ask the audience now. I'm sure yeah, there are Japanese okay, researchers okay, okay. in the audience. If you know, if you know what dollar per kilowatt in a farm gives, please okay. raise your hand so that we yeah, can yeah, yeah, clear yeah, up yeah. on the stage. I'm not sure uh, because the uh, the private the stationary uh, fuel cell cogeneration system in the private houses has to uh, producing heat and electricity. Right? So we cannot discriminate how many percentage for electricity, how many percentage of energy uh, goes to uh, heat. Uh, it's not so easy to separate. The, we can discuss the total amount of energy consumption. Okay. Uh, so one reason is I'm not uh, careful to measure the payment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always my wife did. <laughs> so the another reason is the separate of heat, uh, the cost of heat and electricity is uh, uh, not so easy. And in general, the electricity output is maximum less than one kilowatt. Mm. It's not enough for the usual house. Okay? Mm. So mixing of electricity and heat, we have to discuss uh, the uh, combining both, but uh, I cannot uh, say it's a correct number. But uh, okay. uh, what I can say now is uh, lower the energy cost, including heat and electricity, lower than the existing uh, energy. I can Thank say, very much. but Thank I can say much. all. That's sure. all. Um, so I think uh, we're sort of yeah, we're running out of time. But for this question, uh, we will ask uh, people who know. Professor Shikazono at University of Tokyo probably may know and, mm -hmm. and post the answers to the YouTube through okay. Gonchen. Okay. Oh, please. All right. So uh, before closing, I think we have about three minutes left or so. I just want to um, make sure that you have all the panelists have said everything you wanted to say. So why don't we just take turn and tr make concluding remarks, let's say. Uh, maybe we will finish with Ken and maybe we can start with Yasu. Would you like to make some comments for the overall discussion? Uh, oh, thank you very much. I, uh, I was so excited with this uh, great event and uh, yeah, I enjoyed the, <coughs> the discussions uh, with Ken and Alun. Uh, yeah, hydrogen is, uh, you know, uh, as <coughs> uh, Ken mentioned, it's a uh, secondary energy. So, <coughs> the, and the, Therefore, so I think that uh, we have to uh, make use hydrogen uh, with higher efficiency. So uh, otherwise, we cannot uh, be a, we we will not be able to have a hydrogen society as uh, mm -hmm. can define. You know, that is <laughs> mine. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So therefore, the uh, maybe <clears throat> so we need many great efforts to increase that. Uh, efficiency mm -hmm. of each, you know, uh, elements. Okay. That is my 
uh, you know, uh, comment. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Arun? Sure. Uh, so first of all, let me just make some general remarks. Whenever we talk about energy and we want to make decisions about strategies, it has to be based on a balance between economy, between the environment and national security. If you ignore one of them, it'll come to bite you at some point in the future. So that, so I'm so glad Ken mentioned security because we often forget that in an academic discussion. And so, so that's number one. Number two is that when we look at a, a, um, something like hydrogen, which is gonna be a secondary energy, we got to look at it as a whole system. In the generation side, in the mobility, moving large amounts of energy across the world and across land and ocean, and the use of the hydrogen, and there are greenhouse gas emissions in all of them. So there's a question of economics, of cost. Cost really matters. And in fact, much of the R&D goes into actually reducing the cost. But there's also CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. And so we have to look at that holistically at, at all of these sectors, the generation and this competition out there, moving hydrogen and then, and then um, uh, moving hydrogen in the broadest sense of the word is moving energy. And then you could convert that to hydrogen later on. And then the use of the hydrogen and the most efficient use of the hydrogen. And in all of this, again, e economics matter and who, where that energy come from, comes from internationally, you know, control the geopolitics of the 21st century. So we have to look at that holistically and think about strategies and think about and in terms of research in all of these, whether it is the generation side with the low cost greenhouse gas emission free hydrogen, moving side and the use, uh, there's research opportunities galore. So I wish I was now an undergraduate or graduate student getting into this field because this is gonna be one of the most exciting times of, of research in energy and in particular in hydrogen. Thank you very much. Great comment. Ken, do you want to close? Yeah, I don't said everything. Yeah, I am always saying the same uh, to the student and to others. Uh, we have to look at every different part of, it, uh, including the economics and the environment, the costs, and so. But uh, uh, Arun, I definitely agree with Arun. But uh, finally, I'd like to say that the, we still have many very scientific, scientific fundamental subjects to do as the direct conversion from uh, methane to uh, carbon material and such like that, okay? <clears throat> so, um, not only the overview, but also uh, the, uh, I like to come back to the fundamental research again. Uh, but uh, really, I appreciate all of you. I really enjoyed talking with you and uh, Paul and the questions. Thank you very much. And Jun, thank you, thank very you much. for doing it. Thank you for doing a fantastic job in just managing the whole discussion. Yeah. Appreciate it. My <laughs> pleasure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me just, uh, before really closing, let me um, pull up my slide or their slide uh, to wrap up. Uh, sorry, I, I was supposed to do this now, the announcement for the next webinar, but I did this already, so I'm gonna be really quick. So yeah. there'll be um, next week, they'll, uh, next, was it next week? Or maybe the week after. 19th of August, there'll be this webinar on thermal management of electric vehicle, new energy engineering challenge. And then also there are future events. Now, let me wrap up. Please type in your suggestions for future. So we'll keep the Q&A mode open for another five minutes or so. So please um, type in your suggestions for future events, speakers, topics, and format. And please sign up on email list for future notice. And past events, videos, and Q&A are on website, this website. Okay, so please, with that, we would like to
close this webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Ken Okazaki, Professor Yasuyuki Takata, Professor Aru Majumda. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening. And good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thank you. <laughs>